somewhere between punk, funk, rock and rap lies the very unique sound of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They mixed punk rock with funk with rap and nobody else was doing that. The group burst onto the Hollywood music scene in the early 1980s with a legendary live presence remembered for its energy and excitement. Their hedonistic beginnings landed the band with more than their fair share of problems to solve. But talent and determination have seen the group achieve huge success, and they are now more popular than ever with today's young audiences. Yes, it was their uh, very first album, and I uh, had the pleasure of uh, being a part of history, I guess. The original lineup of Anthony Kiedis, Michael Balzeri, known universally as Flea, Hillel Slovak, and Jack Irons, first ran into each other at Fairfax High School in Los Angeles. My relationship to Los Angeles is, is very uh, a long, deep, intense relationship. Uh, I grew up here, and it has, you know, such a a huge part to play in defining who I am as a person. Born out of the tedium of teenage life, the band were formed almost by accident. To be this song that Anthony used to sing to me when I was young, uh, and it went, flee, flee, fly, flee, fly, flow, or something like that. It was some like camp song that, that, that he sang when he was a kid. Hip-hop fan Anthony had the idea of rapping over Flea's bass, and with Hillel and Jack brought in to provide guitar and drums, they nervously played their first gig. Their eclectic music and explosive stage energy was an instant hit on the LA underground scene. By their second gig, the friends had named themselves the Red Hot Chili Peppers, with people queuing round the block to see the next big thing. We originated in Hollywood. It was a band that was born together out of friendship and love for music, and uh, it was more of an accident than an intentional formation of a band. 20 years after that first nervous gig, the Chilis have gone on to win countless awards and produce 10 albums, including a greatest hits collection selling millions worldwide. The camaraderie has, has, has made them stay together, the brotherhood, and the fact that they kind of came up together. The Red Hot Chili Peppers have grown from an underground sensation to a global phenomenon, and they just keep getting bigger and better. Those early years were about music and having fun. I met uh, Flea, before, I think before there was actually the Red Hot Chili Peppers, I was working on a, uh, a movie doing sound, uh, the movie was called Suburbia, and Flea was one of the actors on the movie, and uh, I was sitting with, at, next to him at lunch, and all the kids back then, you know, everyone had a punk rock name, you know, Peg Leg, or everyone had a, you know, Mary House Code, everyone had a, a name. And so I'm sitting next to this kid, Flea, and I say, uh, what's your real, you know, your real name? He goes, Michael Bowsery. And right then, it was just his honesty. I was just like, you know, it was refreshing, his honesty, because that was, you know, I was born with that name. I believe I met the Red Hot Chili Peppers some point in 1984. Uh, I had just finished a film called Repo Man, and I was going to school at Santa Monica College. And I met Flea through his, at that point, ex-girlfriend named Beth Stinson. And our relationship blossomed pretty quickly and kind of, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you know that people are meant to be in your life. And so there's really, you, you bond right away, you know? And then just over the next week or two, it seemed I ran into him everywhere I went at night. I think I saw him playing with Nicky Beat and Cliff Martinez and Two Balls and a Bat. And so we just basically started hanging out continuously. I remember I had tickets to go see uh, King Sonny all day one night, and I had an extra one, so I called him up and uh, we were standing out in front of the Hollywood Palladium, and I remember him standing there, and then uh, he brought his friend, and this guy kind of sticks his, leans over and sticks his head out from behind Flea. It was Anthony, and then, you know, after that, 
you know, we basically hung out, for, for, I guess, for like the next 20 years. You know, there was a certain notoriety that existed, uh, almost like a communal or fraternal type of thing amongst musicians and scenesters and actors and all of that. So going out in the early days, you kind of always bump into somebody you know and it's kind of that sort of understanding, you know, that tacit like, oh, hey, yeah, you know, you're a musician, I'm an actor, or we're kind of in the same field here. The Chili's were part of an exclusive LA scene, comprising trendy musicians and hotshot actors. Their first gig was almost impromptu, just friends playing together on stage. It turned out to be a huge hit. Um, the history of the Peppers, you know, we, uh, we, we originated in Hollywood. It was a band that was born together out of friendship and love for music. And uh, it was more of an accident than an intentional formation of a band. We just kind of stumbled into it. Um, I understood their first gig to be at the Rhythm Lounge on Melrose. And then about, oh, I don't know, a year ago, I found a poster for this thing called the Rap Beat Funk Off that was held at the Cafe de Grand. It was just a little flyer you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers. So I, you know, I gave it to Flea, because you know, Fly or whatever. And he goes, that was our first gig. And I was under the impression, he said, no, the one at the uh, Grandia Room or whatever was Tony Flo and the Chest Pimps or whatever. And the first official Red Hot Chili Peppers gig was the Rap Beat Funk Off. So I, you know, gave him the little flyer for it. So I guess I saw the very first show. <laughs> I remember they were already on stage when I walked in and, uh, I had never seen so much kinetic energy on stage. There was a band called The Weirdos here in town that kind of did the same thing, but the, the, those four guys were bouncing around the stage at such a velocity, but their uh, musicianship was unaffected by all the, the, the cartoon behavior. And I just, you know, from the very first second, I said, wow, this is really, you know, this is damn amazing. It was pretty exciting to see them play the first times. You know, they very energetic and wild and uh, crazy and full of bravado. In 1984, the Chili's hit the studio to work on their self-titled debut album. Unfortunately, Hillel and Jack were committed to another LA band, and so their boots were filled by Jack Sherman on guitar and Cliff Martinez on drums. Musician Phil Ramelin worked on this album. Yes, it was their uh, very first album, and uh, had the pleasure of um, being a part of history, I guess. And actually, it was fun. You know, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I was quite a bit older, you know, than the rest, of, uh, and than than they were. They looked like they were maybe fresh out of high school. I don't know, but um, uh, very friendly. As I recall, as soon as I got to the studio, Flea handed me a beer, you know, so it was re very relaxed. But you could sort of tell that it was a childhood dream, you know, that uh, to do this, you know, like this is, as anyone, as an artist, the first is always, it sticks in your mind the most, and you always remember that, so it's a foundation, so. They were quite uh, animated and excited about it. They had a song on their album called Baby Appeal. And I remember we'd gotten out of it, uh, we were standing on the street and we just picked up that demo tape. We were standing on the street in New York and he was, we had a little boom box playing it and a baby walked up and it was sort of just walking, little two year olds started dancing. And Anthony was going like, I I'm gonna go back to LA and write a song about that. And then I came back like four weeks later and they had the song Baby Appeal which I thought was one of their better early songs. The Red Hot's got baby appeal. So it's just, it was just their spontaneity back in those days. Let's do the Chili Peppers. You go and you go over to program studio, you rehearse a little bit, and then you take it to the stage. That's just the way things were. It wasn't like, wow, I'm gonna be into a, get into a rock band, make a demo tape, then get a manager, and then play a show so I can get signed to a major label deal. It's like, what are we gonna do? Let's do a gig, let's, you know, we have to know, why go to a party and not be the ones on stage? 
Pete Weiss, a longtime friend of the Peppers, was in another LA band at the time, Thelonious Monster. There was a tour we did back in 87 with uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Fishbone, and Thelonious Monster. It was called the Best of the West Tour. You know, we'd get to a city and we'd, as when Hillel was on, on the tour, we'd show up at a city and we'd, we'd be like, you know, 16, 20 guys strong. We go out at night into a different city, and it was just a, you know, it was just a certain sense of camaraderie. Everyone was, everyone would show up to each other's shows, you know, everyone would hang out with each other, and uh, it was just a great time. I mean, you know, we, we felt that we were invincible. And it turns out, you know, a lot of us went through some hard times in between here and there, but you know, I guess it, it all worked out. Everyone's, for the most part, is still here. Chili Peppers grew out of the LA punk scene, but absorbed many influences to form a punk funk style that was all their own. This really made them stand out from their peers. Energy, you know, that that you could expect when you went to see a show like that. It was unbelievable. You know, I mean, they were just kids at that time. I guess they were, um, I guess they could have been teenagers, definitely in their early 20s. And you went to their show and it was just like, it was like nothing you'd ever seen. There was a very large scene back then, and people got very caught up in the idea that uh, there was something new and fresh going on and that we didn't have to stick with that, that whole cocaine disco mentality of the 70s, and, you know, the businessman in the suit and all that stuff. So I think that that was probably a good expression of the feeling at that time, which was, hey, you know what? This is what we want to do, and if you don't like it, well, sod off, you know? But they also had a whole bunch of, you know, influences that just weren't hip at all at the time. They were obviously listening to Sly and the Family Stone and uh, a certain degree of Motown, and it seems that uh, from Flea's musical background with having, you know, musical parents and playing other instruments, he, you know, he was bringing elements to the mix which average garage musicians just weren't even aware of, you know. So uh, they really were, you know, I think in a, in a class of one. Well, what was really different about them was that they, their music uh, had other influences, you know. They, they mixed punk rock with funk with rap, and nobody else was doing that, you know. A rap had just started to come into its own at that time as well, so. I think a lot of people that would hear the music before they ever saw them live thought that that they were black guys, you know, because their music was so groovy and funky and and Anthony's voice sounded that way, you know, and it, it, that really set them apart. Nobody else was doing that. Anthony didn't start as a singer. Originally, he was known for his rapping. Chili Peppers did a show opening up for, for uh, Run DMC at the Warfield Theater, I'll never forget this. We're standing there, and Anthony, like this little smart kid with long blonde hair, walks up to Jam Master Jay, and he said, yo man, I've been working on this rap, I got this rap. And he says, yo, they call me the swan, because I wait my magic wand, and I love all the women to death. I blah, 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 knock you out with a right or a left. And Jam Master Jay just looked at him like, Kind of like, is you crazy? And just walked, just walked away. He gave him this mean look, like, yeah, and just walked down. It was, it was the funniest thing. It was the funniest thing because Anthony thought it was so cool, so down, so bad, and and he just basically got dissed. It was, it was hilarious. I know Flea didn't have a big rock and roll background until he was he was a little bit you know later in life. So it was like, you know, he had a, a lot of real musical influences, jazz and, and funk. And then they throw in the punk rock with that. I mean, there wasn't that, there was a band or two doing that, maybe Gang of Four, things like that. But you bring in the, you know, the Southern California mindset to it, it's a whole different beast. And I, you know, I think it's like sensitive people reacting to their environment. When I was in Miami and saw them in 86, you know, a lot of my friends had the first two records. And you know, we, we listened to him and thought Mommy Where's Daddy was great and saw them at the Cameo and they were just a great high-energy band and then 
Uplift MoFo Party Plan came out, and everybody I knew had it. And then a few years later, Mother's Milk comes out, and that's I love this record, and everybody I know loves it and loves Higher Ground and thinks it's one of the best cover songs ever. And then you find out much later that I guess they weren't that big then, and it was a huge surprise to me because I thought they were oh they're huge, you know, one of the biggest bands ever because everybody I knew knew them. I think it wasn't from the very start that we knew they were going to go somewhere because back in those days here in town there was nowhere to go. It's before that type of music, whatever type of music that was, was commercially viable. So there really wasn't a place to go. It was just I just knew that from the almost the very first gig, the people started showing up, and from the very beginning they were selling out clubs. I mean, from the very beginning. Although the Chili Peppers quickly formed an underground name for themselves, their first album made little noise commercially, and they remained very much a South Cal touring act. Well, I think the problem with their early sound was that it didn't translate well into recordings, and therefore into radio. Um, you really had to be there. And so the live show was, was uh, very frenetic, and uh, they were famous for their onstage antics, and you know, Flea's always been a super high energy performer, and, and still is. But the problem is, you know, spreading the word that way takes a long time. You know, if you're going to be playing to 200 people a night, it's going to take a long time to conquer America. Now, basically, until Nirvana hit, there was, you know, no huge market for this music. You know, it was hair metal. There was no like mega platinum sales, so you weren't really doing it for the monetary reward. Is basically, it's more of a, a, a lifestyle choice, and I think that's. It's the honesty of like, you know, that's, they stayed true to what they were doing and didn't like, you know, bend uh, uh, commercial pressures. They just, you know, this is what we do. By the late 1980s, Hillel Slovak and Jack Irons were back on board, and the Chili Peppers had released three more albums, Freaky Styly, Uplift Mofo Party Plan, and the Abbey Road EP. It looked as though they had everything going for them, but then tragedy struck. In 1988, Hillel was found dead in his apartment from a heroin overdose. Jack Irons left the band, and Anthony, an addict himself, took time out to kick his habit. Picking up the pieces for them was a, a difficult task, but at the same time a necessary task because the music couldn't just die with somebody else, you know, and that it's important to carry on in life and they recognize that. After an exhaustive search for new members, D.H. Peligro finally joined the band as a drummer. But his time with the Chili's was to be short-lived. I got kicked out of the band because of, uh, uh, you know what, drugs. I was drugged. I was on drugs. I was strung out. I was a heroin addict. I was, like, missing fucking rehearsals, missing sound checks. I, uh... I was really detrimental to the band. I was just really, really fucked up. And, I, and you know, Anthony had his problems, but he was doing good. And it was, uh, it was you know, it was, it was kind of crazy. I would go off and just disappear for a while. A few times I didn't show up for sound check, and I came back and he just, like, yelled that he just let me have it. You're fucking having beers for breakfast, and Anthony fucking joined this, and you're, you're, fucking, you're fucking up. You're just, it was like this little guy, I was just like, okay, all right, all right, calm down. After several lineup changes, the band finally struck gold. Now you say that you're sorry. A young fan named John Frashanti from New York had started playing with ex Chili Pepper D.H. Peligro and then Thelonious Monster. John knew every chord and lyric to every Chili Peppers song. Flea was blown away by his talent. So John came and tried out for our band, and I remember uh, 
about three songs into it or whatever, because he just was, you know, he knew, I guess he was, he was a big fan of our band. And he was like, you know, I don't know, 17, 18. And he, uh, I looked over and he was just smiling. I said, Sue, so do you want to do this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you know. That night I get a call from Flea saying, I think we want John to be in our band. And we were like, you know, we wouldn't hold, I'll, yeah, go away. You know, it's happened. We were uh, the minor leagues for a lot of guys to move on to other bands. So it's like, yeah, that's fine. But John played, I guess, for the next, next month with us because, you know, we needed a guitar player and we were doing gigs and stuff like that. And then he uh, was in the Chili Peppers, his favorite band. So that's basically how it went down. They were lucky enough to find John Frusciante and Chad and, and keep it going and be able to recreate an, another, a new chemistry that, that worked just as well, if not better. With John Frusciante on guitar and Chad Smith on drums, the Red Hot Chili Peppers had once again found their chemistry. With a stable lineup in place, they recorded their fifth album, Mother's Milk, containing a cover of Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground. Finally, the band struck gold with the smash hit that had been eluding them for all these years. I think they probably felt that they had arrived around the same time that everyone else did, which was probably around the uh, uh, Mother's Milk record, you know, when when they released Higher Ground and Give It Away and all of those songs started to really get airplay and be played on MTV and uh, the music channels, you, you definitely have a sense of, hey, we've, we've really arrived now. No, well, I was um, in Paris for six weeks and whatever year it was when uh, Mother's Milk came out and I bought it on a cassette and had, it was stuck in my, um, my Walkman with that and Manu Negro, the only two tapes I had. And I would just be walking around Paris listening to him all the time and assumed, oh, well, everybody else is listening to him too because it was just such a great record to me. And then again, you find out later on, well, that record wasn't that successful, I guess, especially in Europe. I mean, come to think of it, when I bought that at Virgin, um, it, I think they only had it because it was new, you know, it might have been the only Chili Peppers record they had in stock. With the band's success in America assured, the Chili's now turned their attention to the rest of the world, and in particular, Europe. Their sixth studio album, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, brought on board legendary record producer Rick Rubin. It was very kind of, their sound was very congested, everyone seemed to be playing all the time. Um, and. So like I said, once Rubin came along, it really was like night and day. It's, uh, I can think of very few bands who've been changed so dramatically by a, by a producer. Um, and I'm not surprised they've stuck with him since. And uh, I'm not surprised he's the most go-to guy in the industry. Yeah, I think that that's when it really did start taking off internationally. Of course, they had toured before out of the country, but that's definitely when the rest of the world started listening was around Blood Sugar. Um, Mother's Milk was definitely the kind of uh, jumping off point and then that, as I said, like they probably felt like they had arrived with that record and then, and then the next one was kind of a, more of a blockbuster that said, hey, you know, we're really here, you know, on a global level. Once again, life was about to get hard for the Chili Peppers. Midway through the Blood Sugar Sex Magic tour, John announced he was leaving. Worst part about John leaving the band was not John leaving the band, but what John left the band to and the place that John was in, the fact that there was nothing that really could be done about it, you know, until John did something about it. It's like when somebody like goes off and uh, starts living that kind of lifestyle, you know, it's, it's like a loss, in the, you know, it's, they remove themselves from everybody, I mean, it, you know, we never gave up hope, but it wasn't looking too good for a long time. Certainly John leaving the band must have really definitely put them in a bit of a tailspin and trying to fill his shoes is a really big job, you know. When you, it's like saying, well, my wife left me, so uh, I'll just go find another wife. You know, when you have a chemistry and connection with somebody like that, you can't just throw it away and replace it. The band again found themselves with the thankless task of looking for a new member. 
Guitarist Dave Navarro joined the band later that year, and he soon found himself immersed in recording their next album, One Hot Minute. The upheavals of the previous year had made their mark on this record, with poor reviews leading to poorer record sales. The band knew the chemistry wasn't right. And Dave, you know, God bless his soul, when Dave Navarro came in the band, you know, they continued on and they, you know, they, they made a record, but it, 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 they was, he wasn't the right guitar player for the band, even though he was the right guy at the time. And plus, they didn't have time to evolve that either. And there was, you know, it, it just wasn't the best environment for making a record. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of tough, because obviously Hillel not being in the band, that was everybody's view, was that that broke the band the first time. And then I think John really made people realize, well, no, the band can continue. I mean, it's, he's a very different guitar player. Um, and then the whole Dave Navarro period was, I mean, this is purely as a fan, too, because I didn't know them at all then. Um, it was just a different band. You know, and whether it made it or broke it, I don't know, because I wasn't the most rabid fan in the world. But John coming back, it just feels like Chili Peppers to me, just as a, someone listening to the records. Several years after leaving the band and having lost none of his old talent, John was back, and so was the old chemistry. Well, we never play anything off the One Hot Minute record, because I, uh, John uh, has a thing where he's not that was during a time when he quit the band and we had a different guitar player and um, he doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> he claims to have never heard the record. Um, he doesn't want to hear it. You know, apart from Dave Navarro, as you know, there was a couple of other guitarists involved at that same time when they had to find a new guitarist and uh, they didn't work out either. And uh, I think without Frisganti, they'd be in big trouble musically. Um, you know, he's an extremely gifted guy Apart from his playing, you know, he's also an excellent singer, and uh, I think he brings a lot of the uh, the melody to the band. Which is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the Red Hot Chili Peppers have had two careers. There's everything before Blood Sugar Sex Magic, and there's everything Blood Sugar Sex Magic and thereafter. And the difference is John Frusciante. gonna be all right all you've got to do is get things tight tight enough so nothing falls from your possession once in a while a group of musicians form a chemistry that individually they they all have a certain personality but collectively it's kind of much bigger than anything else so they, they always have been kind of larger than life to me and to, to many, I think. The chemistry between all of them is, is obvious. I mean, when you, when you see them together and you see how they interact, uh, you know, there's so many bands who when you're working with them, if there's four people in the band, as soon as, that, as soon as the camera stops rolling, they immediately go to each of their four motorhomes and they won't see each other again until they all have to be on camera again. And that's not the case with them. They just hang around and, and they, they are together a lot. Unlike a lot of bands, it does seem to be a real uh, creative democracy. There's not, there doesn't seem to be one dominant uh, partner there. And even though I'm sure Anthony Kiedis is the most recognizable face, I think they're all fairly well known. You know, Flea is very well established uh, personality in his own right. And, They've all got plenty to say for themselves in the press. Um, there's no real dominating, dominant songwriting force in the band because they don't really write songs in a conventional way. You know, it's very much, uh, it seems to be someone comes up with a riff and then they build around that. So, um, so yeah, they're unusually democratic and uh, it's four very definite personalities that, that people are, are aware of, yeah. Each member shares equally in everything in the decision or the power to vote, or the, uh, or the profits, or everyone has a say. So on set, um, you know, it's, it's important that, that, uh, that they're each given 
you know their um, their own you know unique part of the the video or their their own you know that they're all treated equally and I think in a lot of bands that that's not really the case um, they all are very interested in what's going on with the band and it's the most important thing in their lives the band's chemistry is undoubtedly a huge part of their phenomenal success but credit also has to be given to the two original members' perseverance and determination. Red Hot Chili Peppers was their project, you know, and that was their band. They started it, and so they were going to stick through it. You know, it's like lots of people like switch from band to band to band to band to band, and you never really have your own identity. You know, uh, you can play, you know, be a sideman in a zillion bands or super groups, and it's, it's. I think it has a lot to do with, you know, my philosophy is that if you start with a group of guys and you all grow in the same direction rather than like trying to find the parts to, to fix it you know or like oh we need a guy that's like this and a guy like that to, to create it I think you can't create stuff like that it has to evolve you know I think that's what happened with them you know we have a ridiculously wonderful chemistry that we're very grateful for and uh, you know we suit up and we show up and we make music and, uh, and then we put it out Since their first underground gigs in the mosh pits of LA's diviest clubs, the Chili's have always maintained an admirable reputation for committing 100% to their live performances. The first time I saw them, I was a, a college student in Miami, and I went and saw them at the Cameo Theater in Miami Beach, which I think is still around, though now it's sort of a club, but back then it was a, a great punk venue. It was an old movie theater and they'd removed the first probably 10 rows of seats for a mosh pit, but they hadn't taken the bolts out of the floor. So it was just a disaster. And I saw Black Flag and the Dead Kennedys there and also saw the Chili Peppers and didn't know a huge amount about them. I mean, I'd heard Mommy Where's Daddy. That was my, my only exposure. And it was great, huge amounts of energy. And at first, you know, you'd think, oh, well, they're more of a funk band than a punk band. But in, in that venue, they, they stepped up. It was an amazing show. Really great. I, I think that I've seen them in relatively large venues and I've also seen them in relatively small venues and needless to say a small venue is always better for a fan. There, there, there's more direct energy coming from the band per se than when you've got 16,000 of your closest and most personal friends all having a great time. The energy sort of spreads out and comes from the audience as well as the band. So, you know, depending on the venue, you know, it, it seems the energy is derived in a different way. Dick Rude, a longtime friend of the band, has followed them on countless tours, making behind the scenes documentaries. Uh, I've spent my whole life uh, backstage with those guys, you know, because they're primarily my friends. Well, they are my friends. And uh, although I've worked with them quite a bit, Mostly, I'm always privy to what goes on backstage, or I've been in the recording studio plenty of times when they've recorded, and I've been on tour with them making a documentary, so I know what goes on in every waking moment of their touring lives, pretty much, you know? We'd, uh, before the show, Anthony would have, uh, like, this little ghetto blaster, and he'd come around, he'd, he'd be doing his warm-ups and stretches, and We'd always have this thing where we'd uh, like go, um, what songs do you want to hear? So we'd put on James Brown or like some Bob Marley or, or uh, like, I don't know, some Run DMC or something. Something just to kind of get us pumped up and, and we'd run around. The early days when people were drinking and drugging and there were, you know, a lot more people around, friends and girls and it was kind of like an open house. It was that whole rock and roll mentality that you would imagine or that you've seen on plenty of programs before. And we'd have this, this stupid stuff we do, like when we go to a restaurant, when you order your food, you had to say a rhyme, and everything you say had to end with, because I'm a grizzler. Like say you want, you know, well, I want a steak sandwich, on, put it on the sizzler, you want to know why? Because I'm a grizzler. And we have to say that. And by, by the time, it, by the time John was in the band, 
all the rhymes were, you know, we took all the good rhymes and like, he was just like, uh, uh, Grizzler, I'm a Grizzler. It was, it was just a little stupid shit we did to just keep ourselves amused. In front of the worldwide audiences the band now attracts, the Chili's appear as wild as ever. But backstage, things are a little different. The atmosphere is relaxed. There's yoga, there's uh, herbal drinks. Uh, Chad has a few beers. Uh, they, they talk, they laugh, they play some music. Uh, maybe a little warm up, stretching. Then, and very routine oriented. Uh, you know, okay, I have this much time before we go on, so it's time to get dressed. Now I have this much time, let's have the ginseng tea. The band still has a reputation for their wild stage antics. They recognized very early on that it was important to gain attention in any way possible without actually crossing the line. We did a sock man thing one night where, like, those guys all had the big gym socks, the long, you know, those long ones that come way up to here, those long gym socks. And, and I had these little bitty ankle choking Jamaican socks, like, you know, with the, the red, gold, and green. And, uh, and I had to put that on, and they had on these big socks. And I was like, this is, uh, what, uh. This is very embarrassing. Early on, they used to paint themselves up with uh, day glow fluorescent paints and then perform like that, you know, so with, with black lights and there was always some sort of thing going on, you know, the socks or the, they had later had fire hats that they would wear, you know, they'd come out for their encore with these hats on and fire blowing out of their heads. I love playing for small audiences when we play live, even though I prefer playing for big ones. Yeah, I prefer the big ones only because, you know, this band has been around for 20 years and we played for years to blow clubs. I mean, I played a billion of them, you know, and it's not like uh, I like we're this band that all of a sudden became famous and started playing arenas right away. big groups of the last decade, the Chili's have made the most out of the opportunities music videos have to offer. Their great promos capture the same vibrant energy as their amazing live performances. Uh, the videos I've worked with them on were for um, Other Side and for Californication and By The Way and The Zephyr Song. The first video I made with the Chili Peppers was, uh, I guess, probably 1985 or 86, I did a, I was in film school at UCLA and I directed a video called Catholic School Girls Rule. And then after that, the next video that I directed for them was um, Fight Like a Brave. I think our Give It Away video is kind of cool. I really like that one. I really love the Give It Up. I've always loved the Give It Away one a lot. It's funny, Flea actually told me that, you know, being in a music video and being on stage, while to the viewer, they may appear to have the same kind of energy, they're extremely different as far as he's concerned. And uh, the reason is, in a music video, he's not even actually playing the song because he's playing to the track that's already been pre-recorded. He's, he's lip syncing and that performance is being captured kind of forever. It's being recorded and it's going to be, it's going to exist as the video or whatever it is. But when they're performing live, what he told me, he says, that's completely different. That's more like art to him because it's like it's only going to exist at that moment. It's only about the music. He's not so concerned about what he's looking like or if he's jumping around or what he's feeling other than the music at that, at that time. It's definitely a plus that um, Anthony and Flea have, uh, you know, a fair amount of acting uh, experience, uh, mostly in films, I think. Uh, although obviously they've done videos for many years, but it, that really helps out a lot because I think they're they're more willing to try things because I think they're really confident in in how they appear on camera and in what they do and and kind of how everything works. Well, they're professionals. 
you know? Uh, when I first worked with them, they were, again, the best adjective that I can come up with is they're like super balls, you know? You sort of bounce them really hard and they just sort of ping off of everything because there's so much energy going on there. But it's actually fairly easy to control that energy to get what you want out of it because you don't really need to control it at all. You just need to, to be a part of it and capture it. So when we shot, by the way, we shot that in downtown Los Angeles and closed off you know, a bunch of streets and that kind of thing. And it was kind of fun because there was a lot of stunt work and car chases and things like that. It was one of the funnest videos we ever made. We got to close down streets you know, where we live in, in LA and jump from car to car. And the actor was so incredible, David Sheridan, the guy who played the cab driver for four days straight would not break character and just had everyone on the floor. Unbelievable guy. You know, Anthony did all of his own stunts in the By the Way video, uh, particularly the scene where he has to jump out of a cab into the car that Flea and John are, are driving in. And when we were shooting it, it was always our understanding that for the actual shot where he had to jump between the cars, we were going to have a stunt person do it. We had a stunt double there and he looked exactly like um, Anthony, you know, there was not going to be any question. No one would know the difference. Um, and Anthony said at one point, he said, "Well, let me let me just see what it would what it would be like. I just want to ride along and just see what would be involved with it." So, you know, we hooked them all up to to do it. And he said, "Are you are you guys going to roll on this?" And they said, "We said, yeah, sure, we'll roll." It was just like a rehearsal, and we didn't really expect anything to happen. And he did the jump from you know from the cab. And you know the record label and the management company were horrified. You know they were freaked out. Like you know what you know what would have happened if he had missed where he had to, you know land because we were going. I don't know we were probably going about 30 miles an hour, and he jumped from one car to another. And uh, so I think that's why he didn't want to tell anyone ahead of time that he was doing it because people would have tried to talk him out of it. But he's always said that that you know whatever the crazy things are that they do in their videos, it's very very tame compared to what he and Flea have done in their past and you know, when they were going to Fairfax High School in, in Hollywood together. stage and on camera, the Chili Peppers seem wild and full of energy with colleagues telling a story of true professionals. It's always surprising to me to meet people that you've only seen on stage and on TV because some of them live that persona and some of them it's purely on stage and they know it's on stage and some of them don't even see the difference. Like, you know, you sit down and they're really nice and quiet and then on stage they go crazy and they don't even really see it as being anything different. So, um, but as far as I can tell, they're just having so much fun on stage that that's just what they do. I play for a band called the Action Cats uh, here in Los Angeles and uh, for a whole summer we were in the adjacent rehearsal room to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, it was a, a place that's closed now called the Swing House over on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And so uh, we had a daily insight into the workings of the, uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers kind of doing what they do, you know, rehearsing their music. The most important thing to them is this band. And I don't mean the success or failure of this band, but the idea of the band and the idea of the music in the band. Well, the thing that's always surprised me was that uh, between sessions of actually rehearsing, they would all huddle in the parking lot there, usually around Chad's Harley Davidson, and there'd always be all the hangers on there that you'd expect, all the industry people and, and the girls and whatever. But if you could actually heard what they were talking about, they were always just discussing the music in very specific terms. They'd talk about, you know, let's go back in and lean into that bridge more, let's work on this more, let's work on that more. They really were focused on the music itself. They're not the kind of people who show up on set and start drinking beer and, you know, you know, just party all day long while you're shooting. And there's, there's tons of artists who, who do that and that's just what they think is acceptable. And if that works for them, you know, that's fine. But that is not the Chili Peppers. And their friends reassure us that what you see is what you get. I don't think that they hide much, actually. If you're, if you're, if you follow any of their interviews or, you know, any way that they, they need to express themselves via promoting their music, 
they're pretty honest guys and you know of course like most artists they draw the line between personal life and what they're willing to give to their public but at the same time they're pretty honest about where they come from and I, I think that there's no there are no real surprises you know Anthony's charming and wonderful and uh, a little outgoing and he can also be quiet and introspective and these good people, little egocentric, little, 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 he's got a hella ego, all right? Cool people though, cool people, very easy to get along, especially nowadays when I see him. He's, he's made a whole change in his life now, and he's, he's a lot better person. I just love the guy to death now. I used to didn't really like him when I was in the band. In fact, I hated that motherfucker, I didn't like him at all. It was like, to fuck him, you know? And it was like, Flea was kind of the main person who kept me in the band. I just didn't really, I didn't like him at all. He's a lover, you know? I think he, he likes to spend time with his woman and uh, with his dog and just be at peace riding his scooter around, you know? And, and taking in nature, he loves children. You know, we go out to dinner and he always talks to kids in the restaurant. And very, loves to just contact with people, you know? He was always like the kind of guy who would, who would like, if we run up a hill, he'd have to, he'd run faster. If we lifted some weights, he'd lift more weights. If we, if we swam out and tried to surf, he'd like catch the biggest wave. He was like really an aggressive kind of go-getter. Fleas, you know, tries to stay grounded in humility and spirituality and and when he gets on stage, he lets loose like a Super Bowl. Flea was just always kind of like my dog. Like, like I said, we were friends straight away. He would, we would just go and do stuff that I never did before. Like first time I ever went skiing was with him. He took me skiing. Because I kind of left Hollywood and moved out to the, the country. Oh. Where I, where I just go surfing every day and, uh, you know, when I'm not working. <laughs> Flea likes to surf. He likes to just be peaceful. He, all, he likes to watch movies and read. And he, on his time off, he likes to go to probably go to Costa Rica or Australia, where he's from. And he likes to really connect with nature and his spirituality. Flea Mali took me to my first yoga class. A yoga class with Gurmukh. I'm falling into Guru. John is John. He, he lives his life for music. So when he's on stage, he's playing music. When he's at home, he's thinking about music or listening to music or learning how to play a Depeche Mode record or what, you know, teaching himself how to operate a synthesizer or, you know, he dedicates his life to that. Working with John's great. He's, uh, He's unbelievably creative. I mean, his mind is working all the time on what he wants to do and watching him build background stacks and find harmonies and different parts that would really go with Anthony's vocals and also with his own guitar parts. It was just, it was great. It was a lot of fun. I think John is pretty consistent on and off. He, you know, it's always about the music for him and movies and art and very much into that, always looking for something new to, to learn or to inspire him or to take in and become a part of him. He's really intense, but a lot of people who are really creative are really intense. So it's just, you know, you kind of walk in and hit the ground running. You know, you're hitting a chord from the moment he walks in the room. And Chad is just, you know, solid. He's a drummer and he kind of lives his life that way too. Everything is very steady and solid and consistent, you know, very amiable Midwestern type of guy. You know, we'll talk to anyone, we'll have a beer with anyone and looking to have a good time and enjoy life, you know? He's great, he's just a great drummer. He picked up the two tracks we were doing, picked them up immediately, knew exactly what they needed and just played. And He's a very distinctive drummer, you know, you know, you can kind of hear it's Chad, which is great. And Chad is a regular guy that, you know, he comes home, he golfs, he goes and plays gigs with other people, he, you know, runs around, visits his kids, he's always into, into something, you know, 
it's, it's just always, Chad is always about having a good time all the time. I, you know, it's like everyone's f friends. It's like they're just, you know, regular folk. Granted, you know, now they're uh, wealthy beyond their wildest dreams and, you know, move in circles that I didn't think they'd ever felt like, you know, they would be invited into. You know, we still all get together and it's just, you know, it's like I haven't become some big monetary huge success, but that doesn't lessen, I don't have to like back down in the conversation because I didn't achieve. It's like, you know, because back in the early days, I was the one who had a job and I used to have to feed Flea and Anthony. We used to go down to Schwab's over on Sunset when there was still a Schwab's. It was a famous Hollywood uh, drugstore and coffee shop. It's weird when your friends become huge rock stars because I remember the first time Flea signed an autograph, we were like, huh? The Red Hot Chili Peppers have been in the industry for over 20 years. On their more recent albums, Californication and By The Way, a mature and ever-evolving sound is attracting an even more diverse audience. Well, one, I think they've... There's been blips, but they've, they've generally got better. It's one thing, you know, they, they've, they started actually, you know, writing uh, songs and um, they were, uh, they made their style a lot more concise and a lot less kind of jam happy. It was a lot more aimed at, you know, the listener and the radio. They just love what they do, you know, and, that's, and it's what they do all the time. And I've never heard any stories about the band where, oh, it's this person or that person. It's always, you know, oh, what are the Peppers up to? And, you know, they, uh, very much into their music all the time. They're very good at reinventing themselves image-wise. You know, their videos are always very well thought out. Uh, Anthony Key, this is a real, really pays his way as a front man. He never looks the same twice. He loves to come back, you know, with, with different looks. He, he talks a good game in the interviews. They're all interesting characters to, uh, to talk to, so they've always given great press. The greatest thing that sticks out for me is the fact that they've constantly stayed current and fresh. Um, and fresh may be almost retro in t at times, but it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's clearly uh, a good place to be. I think visually they've kind of reinvented themselves. Musically, I don't think they have. I really think they've carried on doing what they do. Um, they've always been careful to have at least one ballad, if you like, on every album. You know, once they saw what, what Under the Bridge could do for their career, they, uh, they took mental note. And they've used that uh, very carefully, but they've managed to get themselves into a class of one, and no one's really. Although there's a lot of bands out there who are who are influenced by the Chili Peppers, no one's really done it like they do. Their music had to develop and mature as they did, uh, and as they will continue to. And so, you know, a band that plays the same songs over 20 years or so, and continues to play the same style of music, I think you, you couldn't help but getting burned out. And so I think, particularly when John rejoined the band a few years ago, that that was really a shot for them that showed them the possibilities of going into kind of some other ranges of music. You know, I hear more melodies, more singing, more soulfulness, more like a little slow down and where people can, can uh, I don't know, just, just appreciate it a little more. Not that you can appreciate what they did, because I love this stuff. That's some of my favorite stuff, is um, what they did in the, on the earlier records. But I hear it just being more focused, them sort of collaborating more as a whole. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they seem to evolve with time, which I, I think is terrific. I think, uh, you know, if you're going to be a leading edge artist, which obviously they are, you have to keep fresh, and, and they're very good at that. They're still, and I hate to, to use a cliche, they're still one of the funkiest bands out there in a way that's very kind of a, approachable. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of forget about it, but on, on occasions if I go to a club and I hear their stuff being played very loud on a very good system, um, you can really appreciate just how 
just how heavy and funky those grooves are, you know, and just how well Flea and, and Chad Smith play them. There's good stuff on their first records, but I don't think it's, it appeals to a, a, as great an audience as the, I think their music now appeals to like, you know, when they did like Under the Bridge, that appealed to kids, to grandmas. That was like a big pop song. They, they didn't even know they had it in them. But I just think that's like the evolution of like growing up and uh, shows in their music. Part of the reason they have developed such a wide fan base must be down to a youthful looking appearance that directly contradicts their hedonistic beginnings. At this point in their lives, you know, they're all pretty healthy guys. None of them, none of them drink, none of them use drugs. They're, they're all into like meditation and yoga and eating healthy. They travel with their own cook who, you know, makes special dietary meals for them. and. They exercise and they take good care of themselves on all levels, spiritually, mentally, and physically. I think clearly the lifestyles that they're living right now are much more uh, under control than they were a couple of years ago. I think that they, that all of them have learned from whatever detours they've made in their, you know, in their, not their career, but in their personal lives. Uh, through partying or, or whatever other things they got involved with over the years. I think they learned that when they were younger that you know you can't continue down that path for very long because there's only one end to that road and I think they've decided that uh, you know if we're gonna be here and if we want to make a contribution uh, in this life that that we've got to readjust our priorities um, as far as our lifestyles go. I think at some point in our days we like on a backpack trip or something like that, maybe there was a creek or whatever that we all drank out of. Because for some reason, our little crew is really well preserved. And it's just not, it's not from clean living, I can tell you that much. Although, you know, we've all uh, grown out of that, which, you know, thank God, you know, none of us are, you know, abusing ourselves anymore, which is one of the great miracles of, of sticking around to see everyone, like, get healthy. have proved one of the most enduring bands in the business. They still live up to their reputation as a live outfit not to be messed with and have lost none of their looks, charisma or energy. But will they still be rocking out venues in their 50s or is a calmer future inevitable? They're true artists in the sense that I don't think that they choose to do what they're doing. I think that they all recognize that they have to do what they're doing because that's what they're here for. You know, I don't know how long it'll go on. Probably as long as they feel comfortable doing it. You know, because there's, when you get to be as big as they are, there's just pressures that you never thought about. You know, because back in our days, like, man, if I was ever on a major label, I would never have another problem as long as I lived. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, when I, the camaraderie has, has, has made them stay together, the brotherhood and the fact that they kind of came up together. I know the touring part gets harder and harder because, uh, you know, that's not a great life. It's okay when you're a kid, you know, and you're just stumbling through it and getting drunk and trying to pick up on chicks, but, you know, a person likes to, like, sleep in their bed. I mean, I'm sure in, uh, in 88, no one said, oh, yeah, in 2003, when they're thinking about putting out a greatest hits, you know, that people would have thought, you're crazy, you know, they're a rock band, they're crazy, there's no way, they can't last, and, you know, they're as strong now as ever, so I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't keep going. That's an interesting question with the Chili Peppers, I mean, who would have thought they'd be doing it when they're, I guess, 40, some of them, I know Friscanti's a lot younger, um, and they're persona and performance does depend a lot on energy, but then so does Aerosmith's, you know? 
And uh, there's a guy who'll still wipe the floor with most 18 year olds, you know. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if the Chili Peps have, have another five or six years. I don't know. I honestly, you know, when I think of bands kind of rock bands kind of performing and, and really, really pushing the envelope. I mean, everyone thinks of the Rolling Stones, who are all, I think they're all 60 and over now, you know, and, you know, honestly, I don't know if that's the kind of thing that the Chili Peppers are going to want to do. I'm sure if they want to go down that road, they will. I, I have no idea what their plans are for the future. For right now, they're together. I'm sure they'll do another record together. I don't know, you know, if they'll be around for three years, five years, ten years, I, I don't know. Those guys are a, a great band and thankfully they stuck, stuck around long enough to uh, become a, you know, a really, really important band. They're, and you know, they're just getting better, that this is the best they've ever been. The Red Hot Chili Peppers have shown a staying power that leaves other bands in the dust. 20 years after their first gig, they are still going from strength to strength. Long may it continue. <laughs>